Great. So why don't we go ahead and get started? We're good to go? Okay, welcome everybody. Um, this is the first of a two-part uh, webinar series um, on climate change and human health in Montana. And uh, very happy to be welcoming you here. My name is Paul LaChapelle. I'm with Montana State University Extension, and I'll be facilitating today's uh, webinar. Uh, I want to start by thanking our uh, partners uh, for today's uh, webinar series and tomorrow's webinar, which I'll talk about in just a second. The uh, partners are the Montana Institute on Ecosystems, the American Lung Association, and the University of Montana School of Public and Community Health Sciences. Uh, as I mentioned, there'll be two, uh, two sessions uh, with the series. This one broadcast now here at MSU and the other from uh, the University of Montana, which will be tomorrow, um, Thursday the 28th, uh, from the University, uh, University of Montana. Uh, and uh, both uh, seminars will be covering a variety of topics related to climate change and human health. Uh, if you'd like more details uh, on the uh, series, you can access this website, healthyclimatemt.com. Again, that's healthyclimatemt.com. And we will be recording and posting the archive of the, the seminar, uh, both seminars, uh, on the Montana IOE website. And that's uh, available uh, on the screen, montanaioe.org. Um, we will be taking questions. You can submit your questions throughout this series, uh, throughout the, uh, the, the afternoon here between uh, noon and uh, 1.30. And we'll take all of those questions at the, at the end after the, uh, the last presenter presents. Uh, so feel free to present those uh, questions in the chat box if you're online. And for those of you in the room, you can hit the, the uh, mic button on the microphones on the desk in front of you. Uh, so with that, I am um, happy to uh, introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Kathy Whitlock. Uh, Dr. Whitlock is a Regents Professor in Earth Sciences here at MSU and a fellow of the Montana Institute on Ecosystems. She's the lead author of the 2017 Montana Climate Assessment. I'm happy. That said, I don't trust him. Why would you trust him? And a year later, he's been attacked by Trump all the time. Maybe the post will get. Could you out there mute your mute your uh, microphone? Thanks. <laughs> well, thanks to all of you who braved the weather to come here, and to those of you online. Um, we wanted to tell you about this new effort that's going on to write a special report um, related to the Montana Climate Assessment. We're calling it. C2H2, uh, and it will be hopefully done in the next year. It's a, it's a big collaboration of, sci of climate scientists and health professionals. So the purpose of this report is really trying to get granular about Montana and what climate change is going to mean for our health in this state uh, going forward. And there's been a lot of national reports and international reports on human health. And so we're drawing a lot of uh, guidance from those reports. And I think this is sort of the way that we conceptualize the way these two things interact. You, you start out at the top with a bunch of things happening to the climate system, the climate drivers, like warmer temperatures or precipitation extremes, extreme events. Um, and then those set up a set of exposure pathways for people, um, things like heat and poor air quality, reduced food and water, um, more infectious uh, agents, people are moving around on the landscape, and those all have an environmental and an institutional context, as well as a social and behavioral context. So there's a lot of complexity in those side boxes. And then you have health outcomes at the end of that. So it's not a simple linear relationship there's a, there's a lot of variables um, that we're trying to, to uh, be aware of and include in our report. The U.S. Global Change Climate Research Program uh, published a big report in 2016, looking at this at a national level. And so the way they sort of set up their presentation was they outlined what some of these drivers were, extreme heat, outdoor qual air quality, flooding, and so on. They specified what the climate driver was, which is the first vertical column. 
Then they looked at the exposure, what's that gonna mean for people, what are the specific elements of the climate that are gonna be important, and then what's the health outcome, and also what the impact is gonna be. So we look at these national reports and think about, ooh, how could we apply this to Montana? And then they went on, and I'm not going to ask you to read this table, but you know, there's tables of like estimates of how is it affecting different um, health conditions, like at the top is Alzheimer's disease, and what are gonna be the future trends in Alzheimer's disease, and then what are the influences of climate change? So all of these are kind of on the docket for us. Okay, so the Montana Climate Assessment came out in 2017. Uh, it was a, took a couple of years to do, um, and we focused on climate change in Montana, both trends and projections, and how it impacts three sectors, water, forests, and agriculture. And so taking on human health is um, a new initiative for us, and it's really being driven by the health community in Montana who came to us and said, we really, really want you to think about this topic. It's really important. So let me give you some background to the climate side of that report and the context for doing it. Um, a lot of this is familiar to you if you've looked at the Montana climate assessment. It's the material that's in that assessment. One thing that we know in Montana is just going back to 1950, there's already been an increase in temperature. Um, Montana, the temperature has increased almost three degrees Fahrenheit over the last 60 years. And we're at warming at a much faster rate, I should say, than the US average, and also than the, than the global average. Precipitation in Montana has varied a lot over the last 50 years, 60 years, and there haven't been really any statistical trends. We've had wet years and dry years, snowy winters and dry winters. And um, in general, Eastern Montana's gotten a little bit wetter over the last decades, and uh, western Montana's gotten a little bit drier in winter. The projections are for warmer temperatures, and in Montana, warmer temperatures drive everything that we see happening in terms of our environment. These are two scenarios of the mid-century. Um, the one on the uh, left, RCP 4.5, is the sort of uh, scenario if we can stabilize greenhouse gas emissions and RCP 8.5 is what the temperature would look like if we don't really do anything but what we're doing. It's the business as usual scenario. And by mid-century in Montana, it's going to be somewhere between four to six degrees warmer. And that the climate models show complete agreement about that and it's happening across the state. And you can see that when we break it out by the climate divisions, um, there's seven climate divisions in Montana, and you look at it by month, that almost every um, month gets warmer in those two scenarios. Um, both winter and summer get warmer, and the models agree with that as well, show complete agreement. Precipitation is variable, uh, no surprise there. Uh, in the model projections, it tends to get a little bit wetter in the northern um, regions of Montana, um, a little bit wetter in a lot of, in a lot of the states, um, but there's not as much model agreement about the trends. And then going into the future, you can see that that wetness has a real seasonal dimension to it, so that it gets wetter in spring, winter, and fall you, by the shades of the blue, and drier in the summer. So we're going to see more seasonality to our precipitation. And again, the models aren't in complete agreement in the way they project that, but it seems to be a, a trend that many of them show. So just to summarize, how is Montana's climate changing? We've already seen two to three degree Fahrenheit warming, and winters and springs have warmed the most. Our growing season is now 12 days longer than it used to be, and there really are no changes in annual or seasonal precipitation. Going into the future, it's gonna be four to six degrees Fahrenheit warmer, and by the end of the century, if we're on that business as usual scenario, we're gonna be about 10 degrees warmer. Precipitation may increase slightly in the winter, spring and fall, but it will decrease in the summer. And you just have to keep in mind that as you warm a region, 
even if you do get a little bit of precipitation, it's going to be lost through evaporation. Water is another big topic in the uh, climate assessment, and this is some new data that we produced for our region, for the greater Yellowstone region. Um, and it goes from 1950 to the end of the century. And the blue is the, the elevation covered by snow. The green is the elevation where rain will occur. And the, the yellow and, and gold colors are the kind of slush that we all hate. Um, and you can see that what's happening with these warmer temperatures is the elevation of snow through time gets higher and higher and higher. Um, simply because it's warmer. We don't keep snow in the mountains as long. And if you look at the maps on top, you can see the blue area being the snowpack. You can see the uh, end of the 20th century snowpack being fairly extensive. By the time we get to the end of the 21st century, there's very little snowpack in our region. Again, warmer temperatures drive everything. In terms of water supply, most of the projections for our streams um, this is in the Montana Climate Assessment show that you, we're going to get this earlier runoff because it's warmer, um, and you're going to see you're going to see really flashy streams early in the season. And then by the time you go into summer, we're going to be um, lower, have lower stream flow than we see today. So a lot of water going to not very much water, and the increase in flow is happening earlier and earlier. The time of peak runoff is happening earlier and earlier, as much as two and a half weeks in some places. So one of the things we think about with health, and I just put this as an aside, is things like West Nile virus are gonna really be um, favored, or likely be favored in Montana going into the future. It's things like really wet conditions in the spring, but more important, a lot of sort of drying ponds in the mid-season, in the, in the summer. And that's the kinds of conditions that these Culex mosquitoes particularly like, or those drying ponds. Um, and so the likelihood of transmission of West Nile will extend into Montana. We're seeing it in other states that are already warmer than we are. It's likely to happen in our future. In terms of drought, we can't really model drought very well, but we do know we're gonna have more days over 90 degrees as much as 35 additional days in eastern Montana. And when you have warmer temperatures like that, especially sustained warmer temperatures in warmer nights, you're going to have drought. And we're gonna see more fires. Uh, we've already seen our fire season extend um, in the west. In California, it's over 300 days now they have a fire season. So we used to have about a five-month fire season. Now it's over seven months or longer. And we've seen these really large stand-replacing fires that, that seem to be unprecedented, at least in the last several decades. There's been calculations now that at least 55% of the area burned in the western U.S. can be directly attributable to global warming. Um, not attributable to climate variability, not to fire suppression policies, but really directly to anthropogenic warming. Um, so the, the composite of those two colored graphs is what's burned totally, and you can see how much can be attributed directly to climate change. And the reason we're gonna get more fires is the simple temperature um, driver. When you get more warmer temperatures, you're gonna melt the snowpack earlier, you're gonna go into the summer being drier, the forests are gonna be drier, and we're gonna increase wildfire risk. So the projections for the future, those of you that saw the seminar last week, are for as much as a thousand fold increase in fires going into the, um, into the mid century um, because of these warmer temperatures. Okay, so since the climate assessment was released, we've been going around the state, several of us talking about climate change, We've been at town halls, we've talked to organizations, we've been at rallies, we've been out in the field with people looking at um, parts of the ecosystem that are important. Uh, and we've sort of from those communities, we've heard a list of concerns. People are worried about water and water storage. They're worried about extreme events like floods and droughts. They're worried about fire. They wanna know what to do about in agriculture, about wildlife and crops. 
Uh, people are worried about what it's going to mean for our economy, and they're worried about health. And so health is the topic we're focusing on. But I think looking forward, the context for a health assessment are sort of these realities. First of all, in Montana, we're all going to be living with change, ecological change. Things are going to change where they live, where they grow. Um, we're going to have more wildlife interactions. We're going to be living in a world of change, and that's a stressor. We're going to be living with wildfires. More people are living in fire-prone areas. That trend seems to be continuing without stop. We're going to have a warmer, drier, longer fire season. So part of our reality is living with fire and living with smoke. We need to live with extremes. We already saw an extreme condition in 2017 and the fires that it caused, as well as the crop uh, and livestock losses. Um, when we had, we went from very warm and wet conditions in the spring to very warm and dry conditions in the summer. Living with extremes, that means floods and droughts, is really in our future. And living with complexity, our decision space is going to become much more complex going forward. For example, when you think about what a farmer has to think about and what they're going to plant and how they're going to respond, there's a lot of factors that go into that, um, from the government and prices and how much, path, how much um, herbivore you put on your land. And climate's gonna, going to add to that complexity at all levels. We're going to live with uncertainty. We can't tell exactly what's going to happen from one year to the next, but we know that there's going to be less snow, stable snow conditions, more rain on snow, more flooding. The shoulder seasons in particular, fall and, and spring, are going to be less certain. We'll have a much longer summer. That's going to bring more people here, uh, more wildlife human interactions, probably more stress on our, our water systems, and there's going to be high water temperatures and low flows. So all those are really part of the equation when you think about health risks. And health risks are this combination of mental and physical health the sorts of things we can measure and look for, their mental health and the stressors that happen there. And then there's the aspects of community health, like how is climate change going to in, impact the way we all relate to each other in our communities. So just to close the, the climate assessment, our goal in this special report is that we want to bring together the sort of best available information on the linkages between climate change and human health. And the reason that we're doing that is we want to help guide actions for state agencies and public health agencies. We want to communicate this to clinics and physicians and various practitioners. We want to help communities and counties plan for the future and develop resilience and incorporate resilience in their planning efforts. We want to help set up monitoring schemes and address what the needs for monitoring might be. We want to better message climate change and message the health concerns and ultimately uh, recommend some policy changes. So I'll stop with that. Okay, hey, thank you, Kathy. Um, and I'll just remind our participants today, uh, questions again we'll take at the end at 1.15, uh, and you can chat the, uh, uh, type those into the chat box in Zoom, or, or you'll speak into the microphone on the, uh, on the desk. Our next speaker is Laura Williamson. Uh, she is the state epidemiologist at the Montana Department of Public Health and Human Services. Uh, she has over 13 years of public health experience working at the local, state, and federal levels, and currently oversees the administration of several public health surveillance systems and environmental health at DPHHS. Uh, prior to moving to Montana, she was a researcher with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity, and Obesity. And she holds a Master of Public Health degree in Epidemiology from Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Awesome. Laura, are you there? Yeah, hi, this is Laura. Can you all hear me? Yes, yep. we can. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. And then um, just to double check, do you see a slide deck, a DPHHS slide deck? Yes. It looks yes. good. 
Okay, fantastic. So, um, hello everyone. Um, I'm really pleased to be here and be invited to speak at this um, important seminar on climate and health. And um, in the brief time that I have to talk with you all, I'm going to um, um, talk a bit about how DPHHS has responded to um, or is responding to climate um, change and weather related events. And I'm also going to talk a bit about um, the data that we have available at DPHHS that might be um, useful to researchers or communities looking to describe how um, climate change is affecting the health of Montanans. Um, but before I launch into these topics, I thought I'd, it'd be helpful for me to give you a, um, some background about the Department of Public Health and Human Services and um, public health capacity in Montana, and, and in particular, um, our capacity to respond to climate change. So DPHHS is the largest state agency, or largest agency in state government. We have over 3,000 employees, most of which work in um, on the human services side of the agency. So this would include um, administration of Montana Medicaid, uh, Child Protective Services, SNAP and TANIS benefits, et cetera. Um, and then on the public health side of things, we actually have um, a whopping 200 employees that work at pub on public health at the state level. And so um, these 200 employees, we provide all the core functions of public health. And this would include communicable disease, um, investigations and prevention, chronic disease, maternal child health work. Um, we have public health laboratory. And then of course we have um, um, a slew of epidemiologists that work across the public health department to provide um, data analysis and disease surveillance capacity. Um, so most of the public health programs and services in Montana are paid through um, paid for through federal grants or cooperative agreements. In fact, um, our federal monies account for about 70% of our entire budget. And many of, most of these monies come from um, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And then um, DPHHS gets these federal grants and cooperative agreements. And then we also trickle this down to our um, our local health jurisdictions. This would be um, health department, county, city health department, such as the Gallatin County Health Department, and then our tribal health departments as well. Um, and so that's how we deliver services, public health services across the state. So when I, um, when DPHHS was asked to speak at this seminar in particular, you know, to be honest, my first reaction was, gosh, DPHHS really doesn't do much in climate change, unfortunately, and this is because we don't have um, a, a public health program that works specifically on climate and health, um, so nor do we have necessarily staff that have um, a lot of expertise on this issue. But, um, and this is partly because there is literal, little federal funding available and or guidance available on the topic. Um, but, you know, whether we recognize it or not, public health um, staff at both at the state level and local level, we are working on climate change. Um, and so, um, so with that, I'm going to talk to you a bit about um, our response to two weather-related um, events, wildfires, and then harmful algal blooms, and um, what we do at the state level to, to, um, to respond to these events, which are um, increasing uh, more, more and more. So the first I'm going to talk about is wildfires. And so, um, as as Kathy mentioned, wildfires are increasing in Montana and across the West, and they're getting more severe and more frequent. And what um, comes to mind for most of us was the 2017 wildfire season, which was was quite epic in Montana. And so. Um, at the state level, we had coordination amongst many, many partners, and, and really um, this coordination was all geared around communication to the public and giving the public um, tools and resources to protect themselves during um, poor air quality days. And so um, just to give you a taste of all the agencies that we're coordinating, this would include um, the State Department of Environmental Quality, 
EPHHS, the Office of Public Instruction, um, Office of uh, Tourism and Business Development, which is over at the Department of Commerce. And then we are also working with other um, um, nonprofit associations, such as the American Lung Association, um, local agencies such as Climate Start Montana, and then um, also the Montana Coaches Association. And what, what all this coordination was doing is, as I mentioned, our goal was to um, to get the word out and let um, educate Montanans um, on how to protect themselves during poor air quality days. And so we had um, we have a website that's quite robust called the Wildfire Smoke in Your Health, which has many links um, to um, for tips for both uh, the lay people and then also local health departments who might be um, having experiencing a lot of smoke from nearby wildfires um, the and then we worked quite closely with DEQ who has um, the today's air website which I think many Montanans um, um, started checking on a regular basis and this is where you know we've got the air quality monitors across the state letting folks know um, what their local air conditions are and today's air would then link to um, our public health page so that folks could get some health um, tips. We had social media going, both Facebook and um, and Twitter. And then um, in the off season, what we uh, worked on over a few years is actually some specific recommendations for outdoor activities for schools and child care facilities. And um, we worked really hard to push this out, especially with the Montana Coaches Association, to give um, schools daycares, coaches, guidance on when to cancel um, practices and football games or when to bring kids in from outside and have cold indoor recess. Um, and then we also gave, um, we have a communication toolkit for local health departments so that they can um, respond locally. And then the other um, uh, public health um, event or weather related event that we've been responding to um, really in the last two over the last two summers since 2017 is harmful algal blooms. I'm not sure how much how familiar folks are with harmful algal blooms or we call them HABs. Um, but essentially HABs are toxic blue beet green algae that in Montana we find in our rivers, lakes, and streams um, generally in the summer months. Um, and, and so this algae can be harmful to both animals and humans, and, and in particular animals, because they're the ones that tend to um, not really pay attention to the, like, what the water looks like, and they'll go ahead and drink and swim in it. Whereas, you know, I mean, harmful algal blooms, um, water bodies that have them, the water looks pretty disgusting. So many humans at least um, decide to forego swimming or something in that gross looking water. But um, Tabs are increasing in frequency and then in fact are seen in all 50 states and um, the state of Florida last summer was experiencing some really bad harmful algal blooms which um, we're making uh, national attention or um, uh, making national headlines I should say. Um, but in Montana some of the water bodies that are frequently um, finding harmful algal blooms would include the Hepkin Lake, um, Canyon Ferry Lake, and then of course others throughout the state. And um, what we're finding and expecting is that climate change is, is um, affecting both the severity and frequency of harmful algal blooms. And that's because our temperatures are, um, our water temperatures are rising. And then also we're seeing more drought, which changes the salinity of water, which then also makes um, um, a good environment for these toxic algae to, to grow. And so how DPHHS is responding to this is, again, more coordination with other um, state, uh, state agencies. So we work quite closely with the Department of Environmental Quality and um, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and um, local health departments uh, locally when we find um, water bodies with harmful algal blooms, and then the water body owners themselves. And, um, and what our work is doing is um, we first have um, stood up a web page um, that the public can report uh, sightings of 
have had and on suspect sightings. And so we ask, it's actually using um, an Esri tool, an uh, ArcGIS tool um, called, uh, oh shoot, I just blanked it. Um, Survey123, that's what it is. And so folks out in the field, you know, if there's somewhere they can actually like submit a report and that'll pin um, the location of where that HAB setting is. And then we ask folks to take pictures and submit those online so that we can um, take a, we, um, our environmental scientists, scientists can take a look and confirm whether or not it looks like the type of algae that might be producing these toxins. Um, and then what we have is um, the DEQ, DPHS, and Fish, Wildlife, and Parks put together a guidance manual for water body owners. And this isn't um, a directive uh, for how how water body owners should um, respond to the taps, but more some guidance on when to um, think about testing your water to see if the toxins are in there, and then um, giving guidance on to when they sh might consider um, posting some warnings for public use of those water bodies. So that could include a caution where it's, where we say, uh, you know, watch out, there might be harmful um, algae in the water. You know, please please use precautions versus um, danger or, or actual closure of the water body. Um, so this work is, is new to us. We've only um, had our second HAB season or in, um, in 2018 and we're preparing for 2019 and um, hoping to get better guidance and communication with water body owners across the state that are seeing harmful algal blooms on a regular basis. Okay, so switching gears a bit, um, as I mentioned, uh, public DPHHS collects a lot of health data. We do ongoing surveillance on, on many um, health topics. And um, we have produced a guide. We call it the Montana Public Health Data Resource Guide. Um, we've got a fancy little cover here. You can access this guide on our website. I did include the web link at the very bottom of my slide. Um, and what this guide does is we, we go over um, the many different data systems that we house and talk a bit about what the data system is, where we get the data, strengths and limitations, and then some contact information um, uh, should you be interested in more information about that data system. But in terms of public health um, and or, uh, data that might be useful for describing health effects of climate change, um, I wanted to highlight two data systems, and that's our Montana Hospital Discharge Data System. So we collect data on inpatient hospitalizations and emergency department visits. Um, the department's been getting these data since 2000 for inpatient admissions and since 2010 for emergency department visits. These data are um, a little older. They generally have about a year lag time, um, but it's um, quite complete. We get uh, over 90, we're somewhere in the 90s um, in terms of completion, 90% completion in terms of um, getting data on inpatient hospitalizations and emergency department visits. And then the other data system that can be useful is what we call syndromic surveillance system. And this is actually a newer data system um, to the department. And what we, what we get is every 24 hours, We'll, we'll get a, a receive a data dump from emergency departments across the state, and we get information on um, mostly chief complaints of, of ED visits. And um, so this data gets uploaded to the state every 24 hours. We have um, 35 emergency departments across the state reporting to us, which is about 90% of the emergency department um, visits that occur in the state, so pretty good coverage, and um, can also be a more real-time, up-to-date data source. Uh, and then the other tool I wanted to draw folks' attention to um, in terms of public health data is we have a um, an online system where we're putting up much of our surveillance data, and it's called the Montana Indicator-Based Information System, or Montana IDIS. And, um, on this data system, this is a screenshot of the data or of the website, and it's ibis.mt.gov is the web address. And so you can actually query um, several of our 
core surveillance systems, including birth and death records. We have the cancer registry data up. Um, we do have hospital discharge data up on this uh, query system. And then um, what, uh, a telephone survey um, that we call the, the BRFIS, but it stands for the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. Um, and this is um, a survey of adults, and that's where we get information on um, smoking prevalence and chronic diseases in the state. Um, but also on this data system, we have um, what we call community snapshot reports. And so we've got um, kind of a, a preset list of indicators at the county level and um, looking at how those health indicators compare to the state as a whole. And then um, we're working on a series of what we call topic pages, but it's, um, it's data all the data related to um, certain public health topics. So for example, we have a page up on opioid use. Um, so that might be, um, Montana I just encourage you to check it out and it could be a good launching point in terms of um, looking at data that DCHHS has. So that is all I have um, today and I think I'll, I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Great, thank you, Laura, for joining us today. We'll be switching over to our next speaker, who is Dr. Robert Byron. Uh, he is an internist who works at the Bighorn Valley Health Center in Hardin, Montana, uh, which is a federally qualified health center which he helped start. Uh, he was appointed to the Montana Board of Environmental Review by the governor from 2015 to 2017, and is a former governor of the Montana chapter of the American College uh, of physicians. Um, he co-chairs the Citizens Climate Lobby Health Team and is a member of the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health. And hopefully we have Dr. Byron online. Can you hear me? We, we can, can hear indeed, you. yes. Ah, and do you see a PowerPoint? Not yet, we see you. Okay, hang on. Rob, we can see your PowerPoint now. Okay, and I think that may, let me see if I have control. Okay, I do. Perfect, okay, and you might, I think, go into full screen mode as well. No, yep. that is full screen mode. Oh, perfect, okay. Good. All right. Well, thanks for the invitation and well, greetings from Eastern Montana. Uh, I apologize for being present only as an avatar in Bozeman rather than physically there, um, but it is nice to see normal Montana winter, whatever that is. Um, the uh, This section will be a a, a very superficial overview. I've called it climate and health, the nutshell view, in about 10 or 15 minutes, a, a look at the health impacts of climate change, not specifically related to Montana, but with an emphasis on that. It's important to remember that climate change is not about temperatures, it's not about statistics, it's about people and living systems and how we interact, and in some cases, how we survive. It was, I'll call it ironic, that a article was published two days ago in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, um, which the authors termed the boiling frog effect. It's pertinent, they noted that the declining noteworthiness of historical extreme temperatures is not accompanied by a decline in negative sentiment that they induce. In other words, um, we don't respond well to long-term trends. The reference point for normal conditions for weather appears to be that that was experienced two to eight years ago. Um, that's pertinent because when we look at trends over several decades, which is what we're doing for climate-related data, that doesn't equate well with what humans or how we think. Looking at it a little different way, 
it, it's imp important to consider that currently in the United States, air pollution, which is the main cause of human-induced climate change, mostly due to burning the fossil fuels with a smattering of others, but current estimates are that air pollution causes an additional 150 to 200,000 premature deaths every year in the United States. 180,000 non-fatal heart attacks, 150,000 hospitalizations. Oh my gosh. And that's today. That's not in the future. Um, in terms of the boiling frog effect, the pot's already hot and we're approaching boiling. Uh, we're not starting with the cool pot. So perhaps more importantly is the impact that air pollution has on the newly born or yet to be born. Uh, fetuses and pregnant women are particularly sensitive to the effects of particulate matter and ozone, which are the main components of air pollution. There's data to suggest that intrauterine growth retardation, which is more than babies just being born small, these children have lifelong problems and are at high risk for medical conditions throughout their lives. Premature births, in 2016, about 3% of premature births, or about 16,000, were thought to be due to air pollution alone. There's increased numbers of stillbirths and suggestion of post-neonatal mortality or, or what used to be called SIDS, also affected by air pollution. Air quality will worsen with climate change. So not only does air pollution cause climate change, but climate change will make it worse. Uh, the particles linger longer in the air. Smoke increases from wildfires that, that Dr. Whitlock already alluded to. Ozone, which is not a huge problem in Montana, is worse when it's hot, and that's a big problem in urban settings. As we'll talk about, allergens increase. Particularly important when you consider that about 10% of the US population has either asthma or chronic lung disease. The health impacts from climate change can roughly be broken down into several areas. We thought about as heat related illnesses, cardiopulmonary illnesses, infectious diseases, which includes food and water and vector borne diseases, and mental health issues. We're gonna start with mental health issues for a couple of reasons. One, those are often uh, understated and it's only in recent years that we've come to recognize them. The other thing is that unfortunately, Montana is a leader in mental health issues with one of the highest suicide rates in the nation. And that's, not, that's been consistent over a number of years. There's data suggesting that a temperature increase of only half a degree Fahrenheit results in more violent behavior. Suicide rates increase. PTSD and anxiety are common after extreme weather events like hurricanes, floods, heat waves, and possibly even after wildfires. Drought is a little bit different. That's a slow, sustained uh, event over a long period of time compared with acute event like a hurricane or a flood. We're seeing loss of community cohesion and a sense of belonging, which results in increased violence, crime, this is also caused by and resulting in problems with uh, climate refugees, which are seen in other parts of the world. Heat waves contribute to more alcohol and substance abuse. And in addition to what I mentioned about uh, fetuses before, prenatal air pollution may increase risk of schizophrenia and autism. The impacts of heat directly, I think it's fairly obvious that dehydration and heat stroke are ones we consider, but probably more importantly is there's a lot of evidence that suggests that there's increased respiratory problems, cardiac and circulatory problems, and stroke related to increases in heat. Uh, a study done in 2010 by Dr. Isaacson and others in King County, Seattle, uh, showed a risk of death on a high heat day was about 10% greater than a non-heat day all cause mortality uh, represented. When we talk about infectious diseases that Dr. Whitlock alluded to, a, a lot of this is a result of the spread of the vectors. Mosquitoes and ticks, particularly in the United States, 
Lyme disease has spread dramatically from the Northeast westward, though it's not a huge problem in Montana yet. And West Nile that both Dr. Whitlock and Laura alluded to are, is becoming more prominent. Again, we don't know how much we have in Montana yet. Elsewhere in the United States, the Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus mosquitoes, which can carry dengue, yellow fever, and chikungunya, have a much wider range, which I'll show information on in a minute. Waterborne outbreaks due to flooding with resulting drinking contamination are common. And also there's increased outbreaks of gastrointestinal disease after both flooding and in the setting of drought. These diagrams show the range on the left of the Aedes aegypti and on the right of the tiger mosquito. These ranges have dramatically increased in the United States over the past several decades. And keep in mind, both of these can transmit the diseases I mentioned like dengue and yellow fever. We've seen a small uptick in those in the US, not huge yet. Wildfires, as Dr. Whitlock mentioned, are becoming more common, they're more intense, and they last longer with a lot more acres burned. This results in increases to both smoke and marked increases in particulate matter. And the studies strongly associate this with increased respiratory symptoms and all-cause mortality, less clearly with cardiac events and pneumonia, though that data is ongoing. Information from DPHHS related to the Rice Ridge and Sealy Lake fire in 2017 showed a significant increase in emergency room visits during the six week period of the worst of the fires, about two and a half times higher. And in the elderly population, almost three to four times higher uh, during that period. Poison ivy is not particularly dangerous, but I think most would agree it's annoying and it's something we all understand. In 1950, the typical plant made about 15 milligrams of the toxic oil. Today, it's up to 41 milligrams with, you can see from the graph there, uh, anticipated increases as we go forward. More importantly is allergens are increasing. Uh, one study showed that in 2000, the grains of pollen per cubic meter were about 8,500, with estimates that it will increase by 2040 to 21,000. Allergies are inconvenient if you have hay fever or runny nose, but if you have asthma or underlying lung disease, they can be dangerous and life-threatening. More subtle, but perhaps more important worldwide, is the effect on climate change on our food crops. Most of the world depends a large part uh, on grains to, to get a large part of their nutrition. Grains grown in increased CO2 environments grow faster, but with decreased protein content. That will result in millions of people being exposed to malnutrition that are just borderline now. Also, the zinc and iron content are decreased. Uh, there are significant portions of the population which are already deficient in these. The other thing is the increased temperatures decrease productivity of grains, and that's assuming that they can get enough water, which as Dr. Whitlock alluded to, will be a problem. I'll stop there and open it to questions just to let folks know. Um, I have attached references and links for more detailed looks at these, uh, and these uh, will be available online after the webinar. Great, thank you, uh, Dr. Byron. Uh, and again, we will be taking uh, questions at the uh, end at 1.15. Uh, our next two speakers will be presenting together. Uh, John Doyle is a Crow tribal member who's been working to improve understanding and management uh, of Crow reservation water resources and community health for some 40 years, including 24 years as a county commissioner and a member of the health board, and 15 plus years as the co-director of the tribe's water authority and 12 years on the Crow Environmental Health Screening Committee. He oversees testing of home water, uh, well water and springs, as well as community education and risk mitigation addressing water contamination across the Crow Reservation. Um, Christine Martin is currently the program coordinator of the Crow Climate Change Adaptation uh, 
at Little Bighorn College, where she coordinates activities for the Guardians of Living Water After School Program. She received her degree in community health uh, right here at Montana State University in Bozeman. Okay, so John and Christine, I've just given you remote control over this screen. So let me know if you can hear me and whether you have control over this. We can hear you all right, but I'm not being able to move the Let's see. slides. Would it be easier for me to do, let's see. Are you John D under participants? Yes. Okay, let me try again. So let's see, I'll give you a moment there. There you go. <laughs> okay, let me get back here. Okay. Okay, so uh, to begin with, uh, you know, Christine and myself are gonna go through these slides that, together. And she might have a comment to make and I may have a comment to make, but um, we'll get through them a little quicker that way, I believe. And so the purpose of our participation in uh, this discussion is uh, what we've observed on the Crow Reservation and uh, while we're out uh, in the communities and in the rural areas testing home well water and the, the changes that we've seen occurring uh, even uh, since we initially began this program in the past few years, um, there's been changes that are very obvious to us. And so, um, and so with this um, project, we wanted to um, get a better understanding of how um, tribal members, our Crow tribal members, have viewed weather changes throughout their lifetime. And so we wanted to use both traditional ecological knowledge as well as Western science and put them side by side and compare them to see if they both agreed with each other. Uh, this photograph uh, shows us a couple years ago up in the Bighorn Mountains gathering uh, bear root. And it's a traditional plant that we've used for centuries as part of our spiritual and med medical uses. And uh, you know, you see changes in the availability of that plant also. In that beautiful lush area that we're in, uh, that used to be an abundant plant. Now you have to search for it. So um, the changes that we're seeing are very um, kind of rapid to us. You know, you're used to being that stuff being available and all of a sudden it isn't. And so these photo, this next photo is uh, we see winter snowfall uh, declining and it has been for the past 50 years in the Bighorn Mountains. And so we get used to uh, that less snow available and then last year and now again this year we see something entirely different. And uh, we, we say that's weather and it's not climate. But when you're talking about uh, the impacts that it's having on families and uh, communities, then uh, you know that's hard to separate out. You know, how do you, how do you, how do you distinguish that? And um, the snow we see is different snow. It's powder. You know, it carries no moisture in it. And yet, at the same time, um, it's, it creates all the hardship that comes with uh, that amount of snow. So this is just a ch chart showing that there is a total decrease in the annual snowfall, like um, we heard earlier. Um, we have recently put in a new weather station here in Crow so we can get like accurate data from, I think we have like a year now. And so that's ongoing. And so that's just to help sh um, show us our rainfall, our snowfall, um, and just our weather in our area. And also another thing on that weather station, you know, it shows us um, temperatures, um, air temperatures, as well as ground temperatures at uh, four different levels from four inches to 36 inches. And last year when we had them extreme hot days, uh, we were looking at ground temperatures four inches deep at 80 degrees. And you know, that's, that's different too. Uh, again, here's another photograph of the Little Bighorn uh, River to the right a little bit. and The snowfall that looks so beautiful, but is also, um, you know, right now we have a lot of snow, but it's still powder with very little moisture in that water. 
or in that snow. Um, participants also mentioned how that they felt that there were um, fewer days that had um, sub-zero temperatures or that um, fewer days that had frost um, um, outside when they came out. And so this just um, states or shows that people have noticed less temperatures, less winter temperatures or milder temperatures. And that, um, but again, like I was saying earlier, how we think that, oh, we're seeing less milder temperatures, but then again, this year, it's kind of throwing us off. So we really kind of don't have nothing to compare it to. And so the next um, one talks about how the spring ice breakup and so back in the 80s or even um, previous prior to that, um, people were used to having ice jams and they would go out or they could hear people breaking up the ice jams. And throughout the years coming closer to today, they haven't seen or heard any of that today. And so they just feel that there is less ice in the rivers or they notice less ice in the rivers. And so that is one of their indicators that they kind of use to show climate change. Uh, another part to that is um, instead of the ice going out in these big ice flow jams like you're seeing there, it just melts. And so twice this winter, this winter alone, the, the Little Bighorn River has opened up, meaning the ice has melted back and then closed again. And so right now the Little Bighorn River is iced over pretty solidly, but how thick that ice is, I couldn't tell you because less than a month ago the river was flowing open and water was uh, flowing over any ice that was left there. So. Well, so just like we were saying earlier, that the winter patterns are changing. And so we've noticed less snowpack in the mountains or the, how John was saying, how the river is um, freezing, unfreezing, or even we don't, we are used to thick ice, but it hasn't been that thick. And so we um, participants just noticed that their the winter weather patterns are changing more frequently. Yeah, and you know, uh, again, uh, three weeks ago we were looking at the Bighorn Mountains, and there was just patches of snow up there. You know, I was wondering what kind of summer are we going to have now uh, when you can see bare ground on the mountains. Now they're white, but again, it's probably the same powder that we have down here. It's not a lot of moisture on it. And so this chart just shows that there is an increasing average annual temperature. And so we're looking at the Hardin Crow Agency area using our um, weather stations. And so it just shows again that, um, like Kathy stated earlier, that the average temperatures are um, slowly increasing. Um, participants also noticed that there are longer, hotter summers and that there are fewer hot days in March and then kind of lingering into April, but that when you come into September that the hot weather usually lasts into then and that it's um, making more people stay inside so we're not going out more and we're not doing cultural activities and it's harder on the elders and the young ones. Um, so here this map just also again shows that um, the days exceeding 90 degrees Fahrenheit are increasing um, compared from like, 1990 on to 2000. And it's this isn't increasing temperatures, it's, uh, it's just uh, miserable hot, you know, it's just uh, burning heat, dry burning heat. And so this one just shows again the increase of average annual temperatures. And so participants also mentioned how they noticed less rainfall from compared to previous years and how they feel like this could be impacting the <clears throat> um, nature or eco ecology around them, such as the berries or the plant life, and that they noticed in some areas where they go, they, there isn't no berries to be picked, and it just kind of um, confuses them or they don't understand what's going on. In some years, they'll go back and they'll be there, but they won't be abundant. And so this, sh this shows that there is declining annual precipitation and that there is decline in winter snowpack and that it's not being made up during other seasons. And so again, these are from our weather station data from the Harding Co-Agency area. 
Okay, this is uh, I think this is the 2011 flood in uh, in the Crow Agency area, and so that there basically, uh, you know, it's changed our river. Uh, you know, we we talk to our uh, elders, and they remember how the rivers used to flow down the little Bighorn Valley, and you know there was crossings all over. Now the banks are eroded way back. We're losing vegetation along that area, and um, you know wells are being affected by the changes of those flows in the river. And because of where we live is so rural, that flooding really has a big impact on our community. And so people, a lot of people rely on home wells. And so when it floods, or if their floods are more frequent, then that's impacting their drinking water system. And so again, it impacts their health. And so just a big circle cycle that um, we need to address. Um, you want to take this one, John? So on the right is, a, is again another photograph of the flooding that happened in Crow Agency in 2011. And um, it's just the unpredictability of the river and the flooding. And also that it's more frequent. So again, like we heard before that uh, climate change is impacting wildfires. And so we are seeing more wildfires than we have in previous years. And so participants also mentioned this. And I think in uh, 2012, like shown in the picture below, um, states that we had an increased number of fires within our area. And then again, just three years later, um, a drastic increase in wildfires. And so again, participants just um, noticed that there were more wildfires around them and that it could be um, from climate change. And then the smoke, like has been mentioned previously, that uh, you know smoke comes in July and sometimes it's here until September, and um, you can look at the sky and it's uh, kind of a dirty yellow. And the sun, you can almost look at the sun because of the smoke. So again, that affects all of our breathing and the health. So this is a, a area that's really of concern to us as we watch the Little Bighorn River uh, nearly disappear in several different periods of time over the last 20 years. And uh, we, we're jumping from one extreme to the other. <clears throat> we see the flood that's uh, changing the course of the river banks and the flow of the river. And then, um, then there's nothing. And we see uh, what happens to the fish in the rivers. Uh, you know, it's like they're gasping for uh, for oxygen to breathe, you'll, you'll see them surfacing. And um, that applies to all of the, the animals and wildlife that live in and along the banks of the river. Well, again, extreme events with that drought, unpredictable. Participants um, felt like there was a loss of bird species. And so they noticed that throughout their lifetime that there would be birds that come and go and that they don't understand why some of them don't come back or why they see new birds. Um, the prairie chicken or the sage grouse used to be really plentiful and that's what a lot of elders remember but compared to today they don't see them as much anymore and it kind of um, has an impact on them. So the same thing as John was mentioning earlier, um, loss of plants. So uh, participants felt like um, when they went places to pick their berries or their mint, that um, it wasn't as plentiful as it had been in previous years. And so they felt like that this was part of climate change. And so this was one of a main common theme that we've seen throughout the interviews. So again, here's a photograph of the Little Bighorn River on the left with the kids utilizing that river. And what we've seen in the river is uh, extreme high counts of bacteria in there. And that's not only E. coli, but coliform and other things as well. And so yet it's still a major recreation area for our communities from the top of the drainage down to the bottom. People use the river on a daily basis. So with the changing climate, changing temperatures, our rivers are being affected pretty dramatically. And on the right, there is a photograph of the frog. And I, I took that picture when we were out 
along the upper end of the Little Bighorn one day because <clears throat> there, <clears throat> there were so few that uh, when I was a kid, I remembered them everywhere. You walk along the, the river and uh, they were everywhere and then nothing. And so here's a frog that I ran into uh, a few years ago and I thought, I'm taking its picture because we don't see them. And then last year, after we had that horrendous river or winter and that snow piled up and it seems like it wasn't going to end. As soon as the weather broke and changed, uh, there was more frogs than I've ever seen in my life. And it wasn't only along the, the Little Bighorn River, but it was out on the flats in the driest parts of uh, the valley to the east of Crow Agency. There was frogs that would run over all over on the road. It was almost like grasshoppers. There were so many frogs, I couldn't believe it, from the size of our thumbnail all the way up to uh, really large frogs. And uh, I still don't understand what mechanism it was that brought uh, that many frogs. You could walk across the lawn here at Little Bighorn College and there'd be frogs jumping around everywhere. And it was, it was weird. So, um, again, uh, you know, it's a loss of all of our resources, whether it's the plants and berries, but it's a change that uh, it's coming into our life. And uh, we really have no uh, solutions that we can point to when we are out visiting with families and uh, talking about uh, and asking them about their uh, their observations and their memories and the historical memories that they might share with us. And uh, when when the question comes back is what is our solution and what is our directions, uh, there really isn't a lot of uh, information that we can share with them because we all feel that same need to try to do something but not knowing what to do. And so another major theme that came about in the interviews was loss. And so this was kind of brought over um, several um, areas. So again, we've asked participants to talk about um, previous times and compare them to today. And so a lot of people talked about how um, the plants and the animals are disappearing compared to when they were children, as well as how the river has changed quite dramatically and how they used to use the river and how today they don't encourage their, even their kids to swim in it or how they um, you find different ways to use the water. But all in all, they felt like there was a loss of um, just everyday cultural society, familial stuff that may be impacted by climate change. And so then again, we at the end, we felt like, how does TEK compare to Western science? And so we felt like the TEK, they provide more like qualitative observations. And so you're able to do interviews and talk to people and share um, interaction back and forth. Compare that to Western science when you just like, it's data collected, put out, and then everyone reads it. And so there's kind of no interaction between that. And so we felt like if we took both of them and put them together that we could see that um, they both may have the same meaning to this people. Anything? And then there's also two ways of knowing. So um, with TEK, there's like energy and power and just the part of talking about the past that we feel when we talk to people. Um, a lot of people in our culture, this, this is their way of knowing. Um, and they learned a lot of it through oral history. And then when we compared that to Western data, we felt like um, that was just one person or maybe a group of people and that it didn't really have no cultural significance to it. So. Uh, on the top line there is uh, our, our steering committee members. And uh, that has changed kind of periodically throughout the years. Uh, you see Mari Ager, Christine Martin, Emery Three Irons, Sarah Lefthan, Young, and then uh, Myra Lefthan, and then myself. And uh, on the far end there is Ann Camper. And some of the members that you see there are no longer there. They're, they're doing other jobs. But over the years, we've had quite a large number of uh, individuals participate and be involved in uh, trying to understand what's going on in our communities and our waters. <clears throat> And so just in conclusion, we felt like we 
our tribe has been in the same place for many generations and that we have seen many and have experienced many um, impacts from climate change and that um, we will continuously keep monitoring it and that we want to include our tribal community members in it and have them get a better understanding and current knowledge of what's going on. And so we felt like using both sources of um, data, using Western data and TEK data to help them get a better understanding. Uh, again, here's some photographs of uh, some of the individuals uh, that we've been involved with and participated with. The one on the left is a view from Pretty Eagle Point into the Bighorn Canyon. And then uh, the large group picture is Little Bighorn College uh, staff and faculty. Again, in the middle is a photo from probably about 10 years ago, steering committee members and researchers that we worked with. And then on the far right is uh, Guardians of the Living Water, where uh, the program basically uh, PI on it is uh, Vanessa Simons, and she is basically trying to bring that awareness of water and the importance and the care of it to our younger generation so that we grow our own scientists. And then, uh, <clears throat> you know, we've uh, like I said, we've, we've had many, many different people participate and, and various levels. We've worked with many different tribes and nations and, uh, you know, we've tried to gather as much information that we can share with our communities and also give them some kind of uh, sense of direction. And, um, this is a list of the uh, Crow Environmental Health Steering Committee and um, Myra Lefton, Sarah Young, Eric Burton Brown, Christine Martin, Emery Three Arms, Roberta Other Medicine, Dion Pretty on top, and then Dr. Camper and Maury Eggers have both been uh, with us since the very beginning of uh, our involvement as a steering committee. We've worked with uh, staff and many of the researchers at MSU Bozeman, uh, students and graduate students, and Professors. And this is, go ahead. So this, we want to thank our funders. You know, this is all of the funders that we have listed here. We could go through them all, but I think uh, just to keep things moving along. And then this is a photograph of Crow Fair. And again, you see the kids in the little Bighorn River and uh, when it's a hot, dusty day out in the camp, the kids are full of uh, all, the river's full of kids, but adults too. And that's it, the end of our presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I've got a round of applause. So Madison will be taking care of the technology. We have about 15 minutes uh, for questions for our presenters and, um, Madison will get to make sure that they're all uh, still online and able to hear us. Uh, so we'll take questions via the, the, the chat box on Zoom, but maybe we'll start with questions in this room uh, for any of the, the presenters. Yeah. And you, if you could hit your the uh, microphone uh, that's in front of you there. So this, I guess, would be for Laura, the um, public health. Okay, Laura, can you hear the... the uh, the question? The speaker's on, so. Laura, are yeah, you? Yep, oh. I'm here. Great, go ahead with your question. Hi, Laura, a couple quick questions. With the algal blooms, what's the mechanism of, of infection? Is it accidental consumption when you're in those waters or just exposure to the toxins in the water? And second question, are federal funds matching the increase in incidences of public health issues as they increase over time? <laughs> okay, um, so the first one about, about harmful algal blooms. So, um, uh, 
getting uh, getting in the water, like swimming in the water for, for humans particularly can be an irritant to the skin. And so some folks are reporting rashes and, and okay. such. So it's, um, it's dermal exposure, but then also the accidental ingestion of the water um, can cause, um, uh, you know, digestive issues. And then even breathing in the water can also cause some uh, respiratory issues so it's kind of it's um it's threefold and then animals tend to be actually um really affected because you know cattle or dogs will be drinking the water and so some of them can get quite sick there have been reports of cattle dying not i'm not aware of any in montana per se but i'm um, around the country they um you typically see animals getting sick or dying before any human um, health effects. Great. Any follow-up questions? Yeah, oh, and then and then there's a question about funding. Yep. Yep. Okay. So funding in general for public health, um, you know, it ebbs and flows. Right now, we're getting a ton, a ton of money for um, addressing the opioid uh, epidemic. Um, and that seems to be where the most money is coming from. And then, you know, other programs, it does ebb and flow. Um, uh, I'm just trying to think of other health areas that have either seen increases or decreases. Many of them are staying, for the most part, pretty stable. Um, monies are kind of switching around a bit, too, with... Um, um, with Obamacare and Medicaid expansion. Um, and so we used to get some money for direct services for say cancer screenings, for example, and then even for HIV testing. Um, and those have decreased just because we have more people on insurance. And so we don't need um, uh, money to pay for direct services for those who can't afford it. Great, thank you, Laura. Other questions yep. from individuals in the room? Question in the back here, and if you could hit the microphone. This one? Okay, can you hear me? Uh, this is direct more for all of you that uh, presented, and my question is, has there been any thought into um, a social collapse due to a um, climate event? <laughs> So again, the uh, question for all the presenters uh, about a social collapse. So Paul, this is, this is Rob Byron. Um, the, uh, you know, one isolated event was the, uh, the fires in California with uh, the involved Chico and Paradise, which basically it wiped out the entire community. Um, in, a, in a different perspective, the in the, the mid 2000s, there was a prolonged drought in Syria, which resulted in a large number of people uh, moving to uh, urban settings. And there's at least some thought that that was one factor in setting up the uh, problems that erupted there uh, later. So there's some precedence for that, yes. Any of other other presenters like to comment? I just read an article the other day that I shared with you, Emory, and that talked about the collapse of Cahokia and uh, that they believe more and more that that was a climate-related uh, event and uh, it moved uh, a large number of people into the plains to hunt buffalo. And at one point, maybe our history connected us to Cahokia as well. And so I think maybe uh, understanding that that type of uh, ancient history that affected us repeatedly might help us understand and try to prepare for uh, some of the uncertainty that's facing us. Okay, there's no other comments. Other questions in the room? Seeing none, uh, we have some questions online mm -hmm. and Madison will read those off. So I'll go ahead and start. We have two questions from the microphone here from Scott Bishke. So the first one is going to be friends with MS talk about the great impact heat causes to their well-being. I don't think I heard mention of MS today. 
Will MS in Montana be one of the diseases studied in the context of higher temps, et cetera, in our state resulting from climate change? Um, th this is Rob. I think we're, we're at the process of uh, settling on the specific, uh, both diagnoses and conditions that we plan to look at and can look at. Um, so that's certainly one deserving of uh, consideration. Thank you. Sure, and this is Laura uh, Williamson from DPHHS. And um, I will say that population level data on MS um, is, is really quite weak and sparse. Um, we don't have much, and we get asked of a, a decent amount at CPHHS about MS, trying to get a handle on um, how many how many people in Montana have that disease. <laughs> and we really we really don't have um, any data system that regularly collects MS. I mean, the best we have is actually um, death certificate data, so you know, end of life mortality um, due to MS. Okay, I'll go ahead and move on to the second question. Um, so Scott again says, much appreciate the tribal public health aspects that John and Christine discussed with the Crow Tribe. Will there, will there be additional tribal partnerships and focus in preparation of the Montana Climate Assessment Public Health Chapter? So this is uh, Kathy answering the question. And um, yes, yes indeed, we want to involve the tribal community in this health assessment. Um, they're some of the most vulnerable populations in the state for reasons that John and Christine have, have explained. And they're already, you know, part of our, our partnership in developing this report. Awesome. Well, we'll go ahead and move on to our third question from online. Um, so it says, this is a question for all of the speakers. Because of limited data about climate change, what have been your experiences with reception from the general public? Well, this, this is Kathy again, and I'll turn it over to others. But I, I think that climate change is one of the biggest concerns that people have going forward. And it's maybe the most um, um, tangible way that we can really get people to start thinking about um, changing climate in this state uh, is through thinking about the health, their health, the health of their children, and the really the future for their grandchildren. And this, this is Rob. Um, I think particularly over the past years, the awareness has increased dramatically, um, uh, both in the general public and in the, the uh, uh, professional healthcare uh, sector. The uh, before that it was very hard. I mean, there's lots of data out there. Unfortunately, it until recently it's not been a part of mainstream media, and that's starting to change as well, which will make a difference. Uh, this is John, and so for me, uh, there's a variety of opinions on whether climate is even a uh, a real event, and uh, I've heard I've heard both. Like, you, like the other speakers have said that there's a, a growing awareness, but I've also heard the exact opposite, that uh, there is reluctance to believe that. And, um, and maybe part of that comes from uh, not having a direction to make a difference. How can one person uh, make a difference when we're front confronting a, a event that's gonna affect the entire world? And uh, maybe that sense of hopelessness and helpless is there and that makes it harder to have that discussion. In our community, in our tribal community here, I don't hear that discussion at all, unless it's amongst us here that uh, are, are more involved with it. But for the general discussion, I don't hear it. And, and this is Rob again. Um, uh, some of the data out of uh, Yale suggested now that uh, 60 to 70 to 80 percent of people consider it very important, but when you ask the number of people that talk about it with friends and relatives and colleagues, that drops uh, into the 20 percent or less range. So one of the things we all can do is start to discuss it among ourselves um, and not depend on uh, someone else, because that, that's what will make a big difference in the long run. 
We have a question here in the room. Hi, this is for the panel. With the new book that was published by David Wallace Wells, The Uninhabitable Earth, Life After Warming, he claims everything is far worse than what we're hearing about. And it's going to take global mobilization on the scale of World War II to actually have an impact on changing the course we're on. Do any of you on the panel with all of your exposures and interactions with the diversity of people you deal with, is anyone seeing anything of that magnitude? Of response or in terms of just awareness and gravity of the situation. Yeah. So Kathy again, um, I think that I think that anyone that studies climate change feel recognizes that it's it's the number one issue facing the planet. It's the most serious issue and, and it affects it it affects everything and we need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions now. Um, I don't think anyone would dispute that. Um, I don't think the public recognizes that, and they don't also recognize the urgency of the, the crisis. You know, now people, we're talking about major changes happening in the next 15 years or less to our planet. So it keeps me awake at night, that's for sure. And, and this is Rob, I would agree with Kathy's uh, comments, and but also add that large people from a lot of other countries, if not most other countries, really get it they understand um, it's unfortunately uh, Americans and a few other countries that just seem to be a little apathetic or not get it. So uh, time for us to wake up. Any other comments from the presenters? Okay, I see we're just about out of time. Uh, I wanna thank again our partners, uh, the Montana Institute on Ecosystems, the American Lung Association and the University of Montana School of Public Health and Community Health Sciences. And remind uh, you all that uh, there will be part two of this seminar uh, taking place tomorrow at the University of Montana. And uh, that'll be from noon to 1.30. Uh, the details about that seminar are at uh, the IOE website and also at healthyclimatemt.com. So with that, I wanna thank our presenters and thank all of you for participating. Thanks everybody, have a great day.